why are the beaches in Mumbai so dirty and the beaches abroad are clean? I was having a conversation with my mother regarding the same. I was basically ranting that, you know, mom, nobody's, you know, cleaning up the beaches in Mumbai. My mom at the end of the conversation simply said that, you know, if you think the beach isn't clean, just go and clean it. It's as simple as that. So we organized a cleanup from Prabhadevi to Mahim, which is a stretch of four kilometers. We had a turnout of around 1300 volunteers from 20 colleges. So we cleaned around 25 tons of trash on a single day in an hour. What's the hardest part about cleaning the beach? The hardest part is basically surviving, getting volunteers consistently, doing cleanups every weekend. Once you collect this massive amount of trash, where does that go? So unfortunately, all the waste that we collect at the cleanups, it goes to the landfills. Now a lot of people also criticize this saying that you're picking up trash from one place and putting it somewhere else. Which is absolutely true but this is the best thing we can do. Every cleanup drive we collect around 10,000 kgs of trash. Let's not consider saving the environment, we need to save ourselves. Welcome to Sustainable Tea with Shreya Malhar. Thank you so much for being here today. You're an incredible environmentalist. I know you're the founder of Beach Please, which is India's largest youth-led community working towards environmental preservation, primarily through cleanups. Please tell me about where this all started. So I always say this thing that I'm an accidental environmentalist. I never planned to be an environmentalist. So my journey dates back to July 2017 when I'd been to Bali on a vacation with my friends. I was 19 years old back then and it was like my first international trip with my friends. When I went to Bali, I noticed that the Bali has very beautiful beaches and it's known for its beaches. I also did a couple of activities like scuba diving, snorkeling and I realized that I had a connection with the ocean there. Was that the first time you felt like you had a connection with the ocean? Yes, because if you've done scuba diving, you realize when you go inside the ocean, you can actually hear you yourself breathing inside. Mm, your and I think I've never felt something like that before. So when I came back to Mumbai, I think it was during Ganesh Utsav, I was strolling at the beach, at the Dadar beach. And the state in which I saw the beach was really very disturbing. I what could only see? see plastic waste accumulated on the beach. Which triggered a question in my mind that why are the beaches in Mumbai so dirty and the beaches abroad are clean? So I went back home, I was having a conversation with my mother regarding the same. I was basically ranting that, you know, mom, nobody's, you know, cleaning up the beaches in Mumbai. Look at the beaches abroad. You know, there's so much of tourism happening there. Here, nobody, you know, cares about the beaches. Whereas Mumbai is the financial capital of India. It's not that we don't have the resources. Right. So, but had you noticed this difference before? Had you noticed how unclean the other beach was before growing up, before you went on that trip to Bali? Uh, yes, I had noticed it. But because of that trip, because of the, seeing the beautiful beaches in Bali, th it made it more prominent for me, the difference. So basically, I was ranting for like 30 minutes. It went on and my mom at the end of the conversation simply said that, you know, if you think the beach isn't clean, just go and clean it. It's as simple as that. And that's what I thought, you know, this is so motivating. I can actually do this. So, was that how you took it? That was motivating because a lot of times we get told this and you know the task seems so monumental and so big like who am I to do this alone, right? Did no, you because have initially those? when I thought of cleaning the beach, I thought that I would clean the beach once and it would stay clean forever. And my mom even till date says that that's the only thing that I've actually, you know, listened to whatever she said. Uh, I called up a few of my school friends. I told them about this idea of cleaning up the beach and I got a good response from them. But the first guy I called up, my school friend, so we were doing CA back then. I was giving my foundation uh, course exam which is basically level one exam and I'd already failed to attempt. So you failed is, to attempt? Yes. This was September 2017. 2017 in the month of November, December, we had the next attempt. I called him up. I was like, bro, you know, let's do a cleanup. This is what I want to do and that. He's like, don't you want to study? Don't you want to clear your attempts? You have already failed twice. You know, I'm not going to come for this shit and this and that. And I was really demotivated by that. But then I called a couple of my other friends and... You know, uh, 20 of them actually turned up for the cleanup. And surprisingly, this guy who said that he wouldn't turn up for the cleanup drive also showed up. And I asked him, like, why did you show up for the cleanup? He's like, Bhai ne bola na, to jana to nice. Is that how you get all the other people to join you as well? It's I, more. I, I think so because uh, I think it's it was just mere friendship. He didn't even know what you were exactly going to do. He did not believe in the idea of cleaning up the beach. But just because I asked him to show up, he, you know, he turned up at the beach. We cleaned a stretch of the beach and we went home, you know. And that was like a mini school reunion for us. When I came back the next day at the beach again, I realized that there was more waste on the beach. That's when I after you cleaned up after the first I cleaned day. up. That's when I realized with every high tide there is more waste that comes to the beach. So more waste that comes to the beach from where? From the ocean. The ocean keeps puking waste at the beach during high tides. So basically, there's a study which says that out of the total waste that gets into the ocean, mm -hmm. only five percent of it comes back to the beach. One person floats on the ocean, and the remaining ninety-four percent gets on the ocean bed. 
gets on, gets inside the like it's in the ocean on the bed sinking okay yes which is almost impossible to remove so which is why with every high tide there is more waste that comes and gets accumulated on the beaches and uh, that when they realized that i thought you know i should do the clean up once again so the next weekend we came there were only four of us including me clearing a stretch of 4 kilometers what do you think happened in terms of the drop in numbers i thought i think basically that uh, the first experience was not very satisfying or it was very what do you say hard work for them because it's not easy cleaning the beach what's the hardest part about cleaning a beach if you ask me now uh, the hardest part is basically surviving getting surviving. yeah getting volunteers consistently mm-hmm. doing cleanups every weekend but back then since it was a you know a second cleanup drive i think picking up the trash under the sun on a beach is difficult but after going through it for like almost 6 years i've realized that is nothing that's the easiest part mm-hmm. the most difficult part is consistently getting in volunteers for the cleanups keeping the momentum going exactly because if you do one cleanup drive or two cleanup drives in a month it's easier to get volunteers mm-hmm. but when you're doing 10 to 12 cleanup drives every month for the last 6 years consistently getting volunteers is always going to be a challenge second thing is funding the whole campaign mm-hmm. uh that is one of the major challenges third thing is you know coordinating with the bureaucrats you know making getting your work done getting things done from them is another challenge for us what do you mean talking to the bureaucrats uh now when i started in 2017 when i reached out to the you know the bureaucrats the employees of the bmc they never took me seriously because they thought oh this is a 19 year old boy you know doing some college project you know he's going to disappear after a couple of weeks it took us some serious five or six months to make them understand that we are down here for some serious business and we are not going to go until we clean the entire beach so that was like a major challenge because imagine now if you think about beach cleanups it's relatively uh, a known concept people know about it right back then nobody knew about it the first thing people think about when you talk about hey let's do some environmentally friendly activity even as a team even as a company i think clean up is the first clean thing up that comes to people's mind because it's yeah. it's very trending right now <laughs> back then that wasn't the case it was relatively a new concept so you know going around and imagine a 90 year old boy going around asking people to come and clean a beach that was so unconventional and people are like are you mad this is not our job this is something which the authorities need to do or the government need to do so changing the mindset still getting volunteers was a task but you thought back then that this was your job like did you at any point think why am i doing this who am i like i'm not the one littering it i'm not the one throwing trash away so why should i be the one cleaning it So honestly speaking when I did my first clean up drive the whole experience was uh, you know something I'll always remember it made me a calmer person because I've always been an aggressive kid so when I went for the clean up it was like a therapy for me you know in in a way that you know I had peace of mind so uh, as a kid you know I was this rebellious kid you know when you were in school uh, you have this one kid your parents and teachers ask you to stay away from I was that kid I would bully other kids I would go beating them up and all those things because there were issues at my home because i had a separated family now when i look back at it i understand but when i was like 15 16 years old i did not understand what was happening with me so you were acting out based on whatever yes. you were going yes so i was this aggressive kid so when i started up with the clean up drives i realized that you know this is something that i'm liking this is giving me a peace of mind mm-hmm. and that was the initial thought for a couple of weeks or months maybe but then you know a lot of people started asking me that you know the beach isn't getting clean we're just cleaning it today tomorrow the high tide is getting back the same waste what is the point of doing it so i never had the goal or motivation to clean up the entire beach that was never the uh, what do you say the primary motive the motive was that i am trying to do something for my country for my city in whatever best capacity i can even if the beach doesn't get clean it's fine i will do whatever best i can for the country and that was whole about it and what do you think was the impact of that first cleanup like i said you know like it really made me happy like i don't know after a very long time i went back home i slept peacefully i was proud of myself like even though nobody was i was because initially people have called me kachra wala people did not believe in the idea but somewhere that made me happy it made me proud of myself you know even if you pick up one piece of trash from the beach or you pick up 10000 pieces of trash from the beach you're still doing something and that was the same feeling which i had you know because till that date i have always been an average kid so i've never uh, you know got any kind of accolades or medals in schools i was never a topper i was always an average student i've never got appreciation you know as such as a student in an academic sense in an academics or yeah i was i was into sports as to play football but not a best player if you say in the school or something like that so i've never got that appreciation as a student you know whether it been sports or in education like in academics so when i started this i was like this is i think this is my way of 
doing something for my country what was the vision that you had for beach please back then knowing that you know your mom just told you hey if you have a problem with something solve it to then you taking up the first beach clean up where did you see this going back then compared to where it is now see honestly for the first year first year of the clean ups i never had a goal i never had a vision i never wanted to change the world i never wanted to start a community mm-hmm. my schedule was my friends and i we would go out partying on saturday nights party till 6 in the morning 8 o'clock directly go for the clean up do the clean up go home and sleep have you done these clean ups being drunk at yes, some point i have drunk i have almost for a year i've done that <laughs> you know drunk go, going, beach clean up yes and i've passed yeah. out at the beach once and my friends were looking for me where have you passed out <laughs> so you know that's happened with me so the whole idea was that must be a weekend schedule second thing whatever i did made me happy you know there was a satisfaction i'm doing something for my city that's all about it it was eventually i realized that you know i thought that where does the waste come to the other beach from like where does it come from then i realized it was through the meethe river the meethe river is the source of the waste and it's one of the most vital rivers for mumbai okay uh, when i realized that i switched from dadar to meethe river so we stopped doing that dadar beach source. cleanups yeah that was the source so we stopped doing cleanups at dadar beach and we moved to the meethe river and uh, that was a difficult challenge because if you look at the meethe river it took me 4 months to convince my own team to start a cleanup drive why because if you look at it there were layers and layers of plastic waste if you look at the before picture we have removed almost 6 million kgs of waste from the bank of the meethe river what does this plastic waste look like what is the biggest um what is the biggest plastic waste that you find there in terms of is it bottles is it wrappers is it what do you what do you find most often i think everything that you use at your households we find at the clean up drives but the most prominent type of waste is single use plastics and mlps which is uh, the packaging second thing is clothing third clothing. is clothing yeah so clothes in proper condition some of them are in proper condition some of them are torn uh, we also find furniture we have removed sofa sets from the clean up we have found a scooter at the clean up which was dumped dumped in the river people dump scooters and furnitures in the river yes because if you have to discard a furniture you have to give it to the municipal authority and they charge you for that so the best way to you know uh, to discard it and save money is to dump it in the river that's how people think we have found uh, sanitary napkins used syringes medical waste medical waste uh, which is a bigger challenge for us during covid we found 14 bags filled with used covid antigen test kits so we have found that uh we have also found so there's this concept called as ghost net if you know what ghost nets are it's basically fishing net entangled with other waste so we found one ghost net at the bank of the meethe river and weighed 3000 kg 3000 kg yes we How had to get it? an excavator to take it out and it took us 2 weeks to get that whole piece of trash out when you know people tell us that hey stop using plastic straws and stop using um you know plastic cutlery that we get with our takeaway boxes and stuff like that uh one of the things that the community has brought up is that is not that plastic doesn't really amount to much it's usually you know these big fishing nets so it does come from the fishing industry it does come from you know people consuming a lot of um seafood or sea life as i would call it do you think that's a problem a plastic nets a huge problem for you see i think fishing nets if you look at it is the major contributor to marine litter right but if you look at the waste that you find at the beaches especially in india fishing nets are not that prominent the most prominent waste is single use plastics if you go to any beach for that matter in mumbai the only waste that you will see there is single use plastics and mlps name the top 5 most common items that you find on the beach uh plastic bottles footwear uh polythene bags uh packaging material like wrappers and all and for chips clothes. and chocolates and yes. stuff like that that people yes. throw away and the smaller the pa- the smaller the packet is the bigger the problem is because it breaks down eventually when it comes in contact with the sunlight and water and becomes a microplastic now how do you remove the microplastics from the beach you can take up pick up the bigger pieces of trash from the beach mm-hmm. but how do you remove the microplastic that's the biggest challenge how do you do that is there a way to there is no way to do it. that the so only way is we avoid the trash from getting onto the beach and if it gets accumulated we start removing it from there and we start putting it somewhere else did you know about this when you started like did you know about what microplastics are did you know where the waste comes from do you know about any of this or how much has your learning curve what has the learning curve been like for you in this process honestly speaking when i started with the cleanups i had no idea about what cleanups are what microplastics are how harmful they are whatever i had studied in school or college you know just basic understanding 
but eventually i started reading i started reading about microplastic marine litter how does the waste end up there how how was plastic you know invented all these things that's when i realized you know there's one thing i realized later when i started with the clean up drives during school days we've always been taught that the trees and the forests are the biggest contributor of oxygen on this planet but unfortunately we were never taught that it are, it is basically the oceans most of the oxygen come from the oceans not from the trees and forest because there are these microorganisms in the oceans which convert carbon dioxide into oxygen because of plastic pollution these microorganisms are eventually dying so they are not able to convert in enough co2 into oxygen which is leading to warmer oceans hence climate change how does that impact us if you know because when i throw something away it goes away which is how we think about the problem now right so how does this impact me and my life and my well-being and my health see when you talk about plastics there is nothing called as throwing away so when you throw away a piece of polythene bag for example it ends up on a beach when it comes in contact with the water and the sun it starts breaking down to smaller pieces which is called microplastic now what happens is uh, because of the smaller pieces it cannot be recycled the microplastics now there is a very high possibility that the fishes consume it or it gets into your food chain through water or through the food that we eat now there are certain pieces of microplastics which are so small that you can't even see them with your naked eyes so the point being is that when it gets into your body it is going to harm you so all we have to think is that let's not consider the environment let's not consider saving the environment we need to save ourselves and we can only do that if we stop using plastics so uh, malar can i ask how you fund these cleanups because i'm sure there's a cost involved there's maybe uh, you know transport food equipment what have you learned about the funding process of these cleanups over time so initially for the first 4 years it was my team and i who you know who's funded the entire campaign self funded it self funded it now uh, like you see whenever the volunteers turn up at the cleanup drive it's a free event so whatever equipments we provide them or refreshments what everything has been taken care of by us and before the covid pandemic happened we had a turnout of 5000 volunteers every month so if you look at it it is very capital intensive for us and back then i was not working uh, i was surviving on a pocket money so i would just take pocket up all money my pocket money that you get from your mom yeah so you were spending that on the clean ups yes i was spending was she it on okay the with it? She, clean ups she was okay with it because it was my choice but that wasn't sufficient so i would just go to schools and colleges do these workshops with kids you know i would get paid like 1000 2000 rupees for a what session what kind of workshops would you do basically share my journey what sustainability is you know basic whatever knowledge i had back then you know uh, i think uh, i would just share it with the kids and you know i would get paid for that so whatever money i would make from that i would just put it into clean up drives that's something i did uh, for a couple of years uh, eventually i uh, did a reality show because of which a couple of brands started reaching out to me and i realized there's so much of money into content creation so i never wanted to be a content creator as such but uh, i realized the power content holds you know in terms of influencing people so uh, uh, when a couple you're of you're an accidental environmentalist and you're an accidental content creator i think everything in my life has happened by accident and that's worked for me everything that I had planned in my life has never happened to me what did, what had you planned i planned to become a ca Okay. But then I eventually dropped out from CA After and some of After failing a couple times. Yes, and I think that was the best decision in my life. Then some of my smart friends suggested that I should do LLB because as an environmentalist that would really help me. I did my SEM one and I realized ye bhi nahi ho payega. <laughs> then I dropped out again though I completed my graduation and I just want you to guess my graduation scores if you can. I was a very intelligent student, let me tell you that. 43%. <laughs> Forty-six <laughs> percent. Okay, close enough. Okay. See, I was an intelligent student, but that doesn't mean I used to study. So I secured forty-six percent. I was very proud of it. So when these couple of brands reached out to me, you know, you know, for making reels or something, I, I remember I get, I get, I got paid ten thousand rupees for one reel for my first collaboration, and I was like ten thousand rupees for <laughs> one reel. Oh my god, that's huge, and quick money, you know, kind of a thing. So I did it, but I didn't ever enjoy that thing. Why not? Uh, so I'm a person who doesn't like being in front of the camera. I'm always a person who likes being behind the behind the scenes, keeping it organic. But then because it was a part of my job, I had to do it. But I did not enjoy it. So eventually, then the Forbes thing happened, and that's when I realized, oh, I should be a content creator. And that's when I started taking content creation more seriously. Let's talk about the Forbes story. Tell me about how it happened. How you were on the cover of Forbes. So I think um, that's another dramatic story in my life. You know, like. Uh, ever since a kid, I've always manifested to be on the cover of Forbes magazine. Uh, that was on your vision board. 
Yes, but under Forbes thirty and the thirty. So uh, I I received an email from the Forbes team in June or July last year, two thousand twenty-two, and uh, basically there was gram- grammatical errors in the email. There was no signature at the end of it. So they were basically asking for some of my pictures for an editorial, and I was like, "He, I look looks like a phishing, you know, a scam you kind of a scam? thing." Really? Yeah, I thought so. I ignored it. So I get a call from them asking for the p- pictures. I shared a few pictures of mine. Then they are like, "Oh, we're planning to do a shoot, and it's happening in Mumbai." I was like, "Great, I'll be there." Then they are like, "Oh, uh, we've moved the shoot to Delhi now because the other creators are from Delhi." So you know, I had a genuine question to them. You know, I innocently asked them. You know, like, uh, "Will you take care of my travel and stay?" And they are like, "No." So when I went to Delhi for the shoot, there were three more creators with me, and those creators had one million plus followers, whereas I had seventy-four thousand followers. How did that make you feel? And I was like, "Why am I here?" So you had some sort of imposter syndrome, maybe. And when I got there, I thought that there are going to be hundred people there because it was a list for hundred creators. That's when I realized that this is for the cover, and I still wasn't so excited for it. When the Forbes thing, the edition came out, I went and I bought around ten copies. I came back home, and I was showing it to my mother. And like, mom, I'm on the cover of Forbes magazine, this and that. Now my mom flipped few pages, and she's like. This is good, but you should have at least completed CA. Wow, <laughs> was that the reaction you were anticipating? No, I thought she would be proud of me. People saw me being on the cover of Forbes magazine. A lot of people want to be there, but nobody knows the struggle that I've been through to get there. Like nobody knows the backstory. Now after this, I was having a conversation with my friend, and I was like, you know, I don't know why the Forbes team chose me to be on the cover. Why do you think they chose you? I In honestly don't have an answer to it, but he had an answer to it. So he said that you know, uh, I was like, maybe I was lucky enough. He's like. It's not about being lucky. It's about when you genuinely work for something, when you're honest, uh, when you are hardworking, and you are not lying to yourself or anybody. I think the universe is watching and will give it back to you. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Has that sunk in now? Because I know you said when you were shooting for the cover, you were going through. Maybe you were thinking about your personal battles. You were thinking about things back home. Did that sink in watching yourself on the cover of a Forbes magazine with all these other creators that you know you looked up to that you were comparing yourself to? Did that sink in? Yes, it did. Honestly speaking, you know, when I saw myself on the cover of Forbes magazine, it was still like it still didn't excite me. Okay, when I got the reaction from the masses, like the audiences, like oh my god, Forbes! Mm-hmm. That's when I understood how important that was, mm-hmm. and. Um, Like I said, you know, like this friend of mine said that you know when you do something good, it comes back to you. And I've always believed in that because, like I said, whatever I had planned for myself in my life has never worked, and whatever I have got till date was never planned. Mm-hmm. And I've always got more than whatever I've thought. So full surrender. You live your life in complete surrender. I believe in one thing: you do good, good comes to you. Whatever you put into the universe will always come back to you. Mm-hmm. So whether you put in negative energy, you put in positive energy, it's going to come back to you. The question is when, sooner or later, but it will definitely come back to you. What did that Forbes cover do for you in real life? How did your life change after that? I think everybody started taking me seriously. You don't think people took you seriously before a magazine cover? See, honestly, there was a segment which did not. When you talk about other creators and all, mm-hmm. oh, he's just an environmentalist doing cleanups. What is this notion that people have of environmentalists? I have no idea, and I think that's something we need to change. What do you think just an environmentalist means? For them it's not as important as it is for us thinking about the environment because if you see how the creator industry works it's all about materialism it's all about glam sham mm-hmm. which is also right in a way but I think uh that shouldn't be the case like the entire universe cannot be revolving around it right mm-hmm. you need to have some purpose in life like everybody mm-hmm. whether you be an actor your entrepreneur or an environmentalist you need to have a bigger purpose you need to have a bigger goal I think that is something which most of the people are lacking right now. What do you want to sell through your content if it's not a product? What do you think you sell? Is it a story? Is it a cause? Is it a purpose? I am trying to inspire people. Uh I am not trying to portray myself as somebody who's doing good work. I'm just trying to portray myself as an ordinary person just like you who's doing some good work but also enjoying his life. Because I have realized one thing that you know we might have the best policy or the law in the country but that's going to fail unless the people don't participate with the government or be responsive towards it i'll give you an example for that 2018 maharashtra ban single use plastic okay if you look at the beaches right now the most prominent type is single use plastic now why did it fail because people were not sensitized enough 
people were not involved into decision making that's when it failed and that's what i truly believe that the government and the authorities can come up with the best law and the policies but if the people do not participate they do not uh, positively respond to the whole policy we are going to fail and my job is see i do not believe in policy making at this moment you There don't are, at this moment that's not something i want to do my forte is i'm good at involving people mobilizing volunteers my job is to change their mindset willingly not forcefully and i think that's my forte and that's what i want to focus on at this moment maybe few years down the line things might change for me but at this moment the most important thing is we involve people otherwise there is no point okay do you think um when you said you don't believe in policy making right now a lot of times when we look at this we said policy should come before law should come before you know regulation should come first and then people are kind of forced to change do you think it's the other way around what comes first policy first or people's active participation and awareness first what is important see i uh, i don't mean that i don't believe in policy making i do believe in policy making but i don't want to get into policy because because i see a lot of people are already into policy making mm-hmm. but how many people do you know are actually going and getting their hands dirty to clean the beach mm-hmm. so i want to be the person who's working on the ground with the masses because when you talk about masses there are different challenges that you come across there when you into policy making there are different challenges that you come across at that level and do you think both are important somebody working in policy making and kind absolutely. of absolutely i think both should go parallelly that's when we can bring about a change mm-hmm. you know just having a policy not mobilizing people is not going to work the other way around it's also not going to work but i have always believed in one thing that it's the people that make a country better or good or bad right and every good uh, citizen is an asset to the nation sometimes if you might not have a policy but if you have responsible citizens you don't need a policy right but what do you do when you think maybe you live in a system where you think this is not my problem cleaning the beach is not my problem it's the government's problem it's the authorities problem it's somebody else's problem is the waste pickers problem so whose problem is it whose responsibility is it whose duty is it and how do we begin tackling that i think it's everybody's problem everybody is responsible for it individually you and i both are responsible for it even if i didn't throw that particular trash exactly but see as a human we have a carbon footprint in a way directly indirectly we are creating waste which is something we cannot avoid okay it's almost difficult or practically impossible to lead a minimalist lifestyle for an average person right and we can't expect every individual to do that so the point being here is that we sensitize them enough you make them aware now i'll give you an example now when we are doing cleanups a lot of people come to the beach and you know toss a polythene bag into the river so random people like visitors will come to the beach or at the bank of the river and toss waste into the river now there are two ways to approach this way uh, approach this problem either i go to that person i start fighting with him you know when you do that there is a possibility that even if that person thinks he's wrong he might not agree to you or might not listen to you because most of us are egoistic we have a ego and which is very fragile for most of the people the second option is you go and tell them please you know you shouldn't be throwing here we're doing this clean up if you want to give it you know you want to throw it give it to us we'll you know put it in the dustbin or something like that that's how you approach people that's how you change their mindset because if you start fighting with every person that's not going to work and we want people to change on their own willingly and that can only happen with love and compassion not by fighting that's as simple as that have you changed people's mind through this uh i think so i have and i think i've also changed my mind said tell me about that you know initially i had this thought that you know doing a clean up is so easy mm-hmm. like for example like um, as a kid you know my mom would tell me you know ki kachra wala aaya hai you know kachra de ke aao mm-hmm. eventually i realized that's not a right term to use for them so we call them safai sathi right now mm-hmm. okay so these are the things which we were taught as a kid mm-hmm. oh which has always been predominant in our society which we never thought were wrong things but eventually i realized oh no this is wrong this is not something we should be doing so this has also been a very personal journey for me a learning curve for myself also because i wouldn't say i'm perfect i know everything i'm still learning new things every single day and that's how it should be then when you talk about sustainability i wouldn't say i know every single bit of sustainability it's impossible i mean the sustainable exactly. travel the sustainable finance the sustainable food i don't think one person can do it all or should do it all exactly which is why we need everybody to come in from different avenues different expertise different skills to you know i think fight this together absolutely i think when all stakeholders come to come together we complement each other now i do not have a background of theoretical knowledge i have learned through my experiences 
through the beach clean up drives through the workshops i've done through the people i've met so for me the learning curve has been different i've seen different struggles at the clean ups then somebody now for example if you talk about technical knowledge of plastics or climate change i might not have that but i might have the basic understanding about how it is affecting the local communities how is it affecting local communities so the meethi river where we do the clean ups there are local fishermen uh, who go and basically fish there so one of the local fishermen was telling me the other day that couple of decades ago they would find fishes there they could spot dolphins now because of the plastic pollution industrialization the water of the color of the water has turned black now and they can hardly spot any fishes there so it's affecting their livelihood it is affecting their livelihood and i think these are the first individuals that will get affected by climate change the fishermen because their livelihoods are dependent on the oceans and the other ecosystems has there ever been any backlash of people said negative things have there been you know negative comments coming at you a little bit of hate here and there and how have you handled it i think i have received a lot of hate and backlash for multiple things something as simple as the kind of clothes i wear It's my kind of dressing sense wear. yeah so a lot of people think environmentalist can't wear hoodies and you know sweatshirts and sneakers so you and i are not allowed to be environmentalist exactly they expect us to wear a white kurta chappal cotton bag and roam around like that and i think it's not relatable to most of the people and just because we care for the environment does not mean we can't have a personal life as simple as that uh i have received backlash for promoting certain brands uh which i think was not required and it's not the audience it's the fellow environmentalist or activist who so have got backlash from so it's hate within the community it's hate, hate from other colleagues and other yes. peers in the industry i also think one of the reasons for the hate is because when there are 10 people working for a specific purpose for example environment uh, out of the 10 to get the acknowledgement or the credits for it when the eight are neglected there might be one or two person from the eight people who will not like that But is validation everything? Do you think numbers are everything? Do you think that see for you and I, it might not be, but for some people it is. Mm. I see a lot of people working for environment right now just for the validation, mm. just for the PR. Mm. See, I'm not saying everybody is like that, but you and I cannot deny the fact that there are people like that. Mm. So I think that could be the reason for it. Um, I was dating a girl couple of years ago, and her parents would call me a kachre wala. <laughs> How do you feel about that? nothing <laughs> was that the first time someone called you kachwala on your face yeah but not the last time not the last time so yeah. there have been multiple exactly. girlfriends parents who have called not you not girlfriends kachwala. parents but yeah in general people have uh, including couple of my uncles uh, family as well family as well extended yeah. family so do you take that in good spirit now like is that a good thing are you proud i say that proudly i'm a kachwala well, it doesn't matter to me the only thing that upsets me you know that uh, not for me but there are people who are coming and you know cleaning your houses your cities mm. safai sathis what if they start stop doing their job for a day mm. what will happen and you are calling them kachra wala mm. looking at somebody's work in a derogatory way is not something i appreciate especially when we are the ones producing the trash in the first place it's not their trash exactly. it's our trash exactly exactly and just because somebody is cleaning your trash does not mean that person doesn't res- deserve the respect mm. right i think that's important Second thing is that so when I came on the cover of Forbes magazine, uh, I put this post and the caption was like to all the people who called me a kachra wala, <laughs> uh, cheers, your boys on the cover of Forbes magazine. I love that right in their faces. So gave it back. Yeah, wow. Uh, you, um, I think earlier you touched upon how you started funding these cleanups and where you are now. Do you want to talk a little bit more about how you sustain these cleanups right now? How um, you make money? What about financing and? the path that you have found to scale these for anyone who might be you know just starting in this space and figuring out this process so you know when i decided to be an environmentalist or make a career into environment i had limited options because since i don't have a, a theoretical background or a degree in environment or sustainability the only choice was either i start a business become an entrepreneur or become a content creator mm-hmm. eventually i got into content creation so my mom would ask me like what do you want to do as like be an environmentalist mm-hmm. okay but how will you make money and i had no answer to it but eventually opportunities came to me i realized you know this is how i can make money and because this was very unconventional for example if you are a doctor you know what to do you complete your mbbs you do your internship you practice with a doctor or a hospital or you start your own you know clinic or something like that straight forward i think straight a path forward. that's laid out yeah. for you because there are a lot of people who have already done it for you so you just have to follow the path 
but as an environmentalist i had to figure out oh this is working or maybe it's not working so i've made a lot of mistakes like that i when i got into content creation so for right now my income comes from content creation from the brands that i work with so mainly content creation mainly content creation and that's the only thing that i make money from right now i'm working on a couple of startups eventually in a couple of years it might be there uh but as of now that's the only thing i realized one more thing that content as a content creator if you're a known content creator it gets you the name fame money which you can use for your cause fourth fourth thing that it gets you to a spot where it's easily accessible for you to meet certain individuals which otherwise would have been difficult for example if i have to meet a celebrity or call them for a clean up drive if i have to meet you for example shreya wow i'm in that bucket now <laughs> okay so that puts you in a spot where it a lot of things becomes easier for you so content creation is the only way for me i also see a lot of other creators or environmentalists putting out content related to environment but i also see it's not working for them because personally i have seen on my pages that when you i put about when i put out content about environment sustainability cleanups a lot of people don't like it, it like it's work. very boring it okay. doesn't work okay so what's the hook the hook is that i make it very funny so for example there's this one reel i had put out uh, have you seen this series mirzapur no i don't think so so there's ali fazal this one of his dialogue ki shuru majboori mein kiya lekin ab maza aa raha hai theek hai so the first <laughs> that's a whole life basically yeah yeah so the first clip is like me doing cleanups and like when people ask me why do do you do cleanups okay the second is ali fazal comes and says the dialogue shuru majboori mein kiya tha lekin ab maza aa raha hai nice so you're mixing pop culture into exactly and i think content. these things are working out for me and i think uh, everybody everybody who's on social media is looking for some kind of entertainment there are very few people who want are seeking for knowledge basically otherwise most of them are looking for entertainment very interesting early on when you said anything you put out you get back do you what have you received through your work in the environmental space do you think the ocean has given back to you do you think the nature has given back to you in any way uh i think everything that i have received in my life i think it's because of the nature it's because of the universe you know i remember this incidents from 2018 uh i was at the dadar beach we were doing a clean up there and there was this uncle who walked up to me so if you know uh, shravan in i think in hindi you call it savan ka mahina so a lot, a lot of people don't wear footwear during that month when they are fasting okay so this uncle walked up to me wasn't wearing any footwear and he asked me what are you doing here this and that i was like we are doing a clean up here so he asked me if this is a college project i'll be getting some points or marks for this or something like that i was like no we do this every uh, week basically for the last one year and all so he was just observing us for 15 20 minutes and then he walked up to me and he said something which has always stayed with me so he said this in marathi he's like tu samudra chi odi seva karto hai tula samudra khup ka deun jail it khup ka deun jail it huh. basically means that you are serving the ocean and the ocean will give you so much in your life will give you a lot of things in life and back then i did not take it seriously but it has stayed with me for some reason i don't know why and if you look at my life everything that i have received is because of the cleanups is because of serving the nature so i think nature reciprocates love if you take care of the nature it is going to get give it back to you if you harm the nature it is also going to give it back to you yeah that's true we are destroying it at an unprecedented rate absolutely in capacity who is malhar without the without cleanups who is malhar without being the founder of beach please so i am this average 26 year old guy with a dark sense of humor so i think i live a very average ordinary life but i am not just about cleanups is what i'm trying to say here cleanups environment is a part of my life but that's not my life i love to do everything else what most of the people love doing going on drives listening to music spending time with friends you know um playing sports all those things but somehow most of the people look at me as this one person who's always doing good work that's not true i've also done a lot of bad things in life that's when i've realized what doing good means so yeah but the thing is only the people who are close to me have seen that side of me because i take time opening up to people so for the people who have not seen me think i'm a good person <laughs> which i think i am people think yeah. you're a good person a lot of people know me for what i do is not because we've been doing cleanups for the last 6 months because we've been doing it every weekend for the last 6 years so consistency takes you to places my motivation can't take you to and i've always believed in that 
I am an impatient environmentalist, so I feel like we don't have time. Later is too late. You know, the deadlines that we've set for the world, whether that's to go carbon neutral, whether that's, you know, to be net zero. What do you do when, you know, time is running out, leaders are not doing enough, we are not doing enough. How do you stay patient through all of that? That is actually difficult to be patient during those times. But I think that's the only way because uh, when you try to basically rush into things, it never works out. And one thing this journey has taught me is that patience. Because, you know, sometimes you want quick results. Why is this not happening? Oh, you know, I'm picking up trash. Why is this, you know, van not coming to pick up trash? Oh, why is this particular thing taking so much time? But I think everything has its own due course of time that it requires. So trying our best to make things work faster is something in our hand. But also being patient is something we should aim for. How do you get people to show up at these cleanups every single week, week after week? People are at at the cleanup. How have you built a community around cleanups? I think it's the leadership qualities, uh, and I have never like I have not learned these qualities in any school or college. I think I've as a kid I've always been a leader and a rebellious kid, like I said. But there are few things that I learned eventually. Like there are a lot of people that I look up to, and I you know try to follow their uh, lives or learn take uh, take lessons from their lives basically. So for an example. Uh, when a lot of, so I have 50 people in my team okay 50 people in your team in my core team that work full time for Beach Please 50 people yeah not full time all are volunteers right like everybody is doing something or the other but these are the core people that are involved in decision making some of them are in abroad that's a big team yeah so the youngest member is 15 years old the oldest member is 48 years old and there are four cops in my team the four cops yeah who are basically cops who are working with Mumbai police and they're in my team but whenever... What role do they play? Uh, usually they are not free, but whenever there are events happening, any official things to take care of, permissions and all, those are things they take they care of. That. When we have big events happening, you know, there could be a problem of security. These guys come in. They also call in a few of their other friends. How did you rope them in? How did you... So, uh, we had mutual friends. We met. I told them about this idea. They liked. They started coming for the, you know, uh, cleanups and all. So, one thing I, which I follow in my team is like, we anybody has a right to make fun of anyone. Okay, including me. Everybody makes fun of me. But when we step at the beach, when there are third people, there's a third person involved, they respect me. That's something I like about them, you know. For example, they'll give me the respect at the beach. Once you're done with the cleanup, they'll be like, oh, this and that, you know, back to basic normals. So that's something I like about them. Second thing is that, you know, now these 50 people come from different economic backgrounds, social backgrounds, also the age different. We have a lot of times have these disputes among the team where these guys are fighting and you know boys fighting they'll end up physically fighting and everything. So they ha we have our own share of disputes, disagreements but that I think that's also important in a team. But I think one thing I've realized is if you want to form a have a good team you need to have good relations with them. Now something I used to always follow is that after you were done with the cleanup pe all the regular volunteers I would just take them out for a coffee. At a tapri, not a very fancy place, you know. So one of my team members told me that why do you waste your money on, on coffee and everything? Because I would spend on 500, 600 every, after every clean up drive. So I was like, I'm not wasting money. I'm investing money. So, you know, when I call them for a coffee or this and that, you know, that builds a relationship, that builds a bond. So every time, so I always follow one thing. Whenever I go for the cleanup, I'm not the person going and doing cleanups. I will make sure I go up to each and every volunteer and ask them, how are you doing? What's happening? This and that. The personal touch. Personal touch, you know, make bonds with them, you know, make them feel like home. And I think that's what has made us, like that's, that's what has made us what we are today. And that's why so many people are willing to join our team because it's a family now. Yeah. Team, I get. I'm talking about, you know, even the volunteers that show up week after week. How has it gone from it being something that you did with 20 friends day one to, you know, you having hundreds and thousands of volunteers coming with you to beaches, to rivers to clean this? How have you grown that community on ground? See, initially for the first six months when we started the cleanup, six months or a year, it was easier to get volunteers. Okay, mm. like why? How, how so? So because I had no, I was very popular in my college. So these college festivals the bad and kid, all, popular. yeah, uh, college fest and all. Couple of my friends were general secretaries into different colleges. So I would just tell them, you know, send twenty kids, thirty kids, you know, unofficially, mm. because officially you have to take the permission of the principal that you know and everything that whole hierarchy you have to follow. So they he would just like my friends would just send volunteers and all. Eventually, I realized the number of people coming for the cleanups started to drop. So we did this event in 2018 called as Clean Coast Cup, which was India's first ever inter-college beach cleanup competition. Beach clean. So you made it. You gamified. 
cleanups. Yes. So I've realized one thing: when the kids need some kind of motivation for the cleanup, right? So we organized a cleanup from Prabha Devi to Mahim, which is a stretch of four kilometers. We had a turnout of around thirteen hundred volunteers from twenty colleges. To basically, you know, keep them in check, we had a team of three fifty volunteers. to keep them in check we had a team of 50 people to keep them in check we had a team of 5 people about it and then i was i so we had the entire hierarchy so we cleaned around 25 tons of trash that day yeah on single day in an hour because so many people turned up so whichever college took out the most amount of trash got medals certificates cash prizes now i'll tell you an incident about the event the entire budget of the event was 1.5 lakhs uh, how did you pull that off uh, we got few sponsors okay two days before the event one of the sponsors backed down we were short of 40000 now i was using a phone uh, which was around 9 or 10 grands and it fell during the clean up and at basically the display broke but it was still working uh, so my mom had given me uh, 38000 rupees to buy a new phone god so i took those 38000 2000 i put it from my own pocket and i invested into the clean ups for the next one more year i was using the same phone so which means that i have invested a lot of my money time sacrifice into this cause because i've believed in it and i've always believed in it like even when people thought this is not going to be big i've always thought that if not big this is worth doing like i never expected i would be this known or recognized for my work but i thought i was doing good work so i always did whatever i've done what do you do it for and what drives you if it wasn't you know for the environment if it wasn't for pr if it wasn't for branding what what was the bigger goal like i said firstly i was very selfish because when i started the cleanups it was a therapy for me mm-hmm. second thing that uh, it made me happy I, i somewhere realized that you know this is my passion and then eventually i realized that you know this is my way of serving the country like i wanted to get into defense like armed forces mm-hmm. or or maybe after that i realized you know i should do ips maybe give upsc exams and get into ips but you have to study a lot for that which was basically never my forte so uh, but when i started with the cleanups i realized this is my way of serving country you know like people are fighting on the borders like the soldiers i would definitely not compare myself to them what they're doing is absolutely uh, uh, great but this is my small contribution for the country so i think that was the only motive and that's why even today i absolutely don't care if people don't turn up for the clean up even today you know during summers there are times when there are only four people you would still carry you still do the clean ups because we have committed this to ourselves and there's always one thing i've told my team we will never skip a single weekend irrespective of whatever things happen so rain or shine the clean ups continue continue even if the volunteers turn up the volunteers don't come turn up whether i am there whether i am not there the only time we have suspended the clean ups was during the first lockdown that happened mm-hmm. in march 2020 for like 5 or 6 months mm-hmm. after that never that's incredible so it it still <coughs> moves on it still continues with or without you essentially so the movement has become bigger than you bigger than a person bigger than an individual exactly at this moment so malhar if someone is trying to grow a movement if someone is trying to build a community for a cause what advice would you have um, you know for someone trying to do that to get people to come together collectively you know to build the momentum how does someone go about doing that you know sharing my experience what i would do is initially like for the first one year i would cold call you know like monday to friday i would make around 50 60 calls to schools colleges these youth communities road track clubs and all and out of those one or two you know clubs would join us on the weekend mm-hmm. so i've done this for the first one year eventually people started recognizing us our efforts and now that people know us they turn up you know uh, at the clean up drives but cold calling is something i've done because when people don't know you you have to reach out to them and you know you know introduce yourself now i remember one thing i was so passionate about clean ups when i look back i'd been to a party and i had my business card and um, i left at around 6 in the morning from the party and i came home and had a, a business card holder i had 25 business cards in it the next day one of my friends was telling me that you were drunk and all you were doing is just telling everybody about clean ups and giving your business <laughs> card to the people who already know you're doing clean ups and somewhere drunk you know, networking ha uh, unconsciously maybe i was just too much involved into these things i was passionate about it that you know it came out that way but i think you have to be firstly passionate uh, cold calling is something which has worked for me i think the most important thing is you have to lead by an example uh, i see a lot of people trying to build a community but uh, they also you know are scared of taking the risk risk is something you have to take uh, obviously you are going to fail and because i 
think I took risk at a very young age and I failed at a very young age uh, I can see the days what I'm seeing right now so it's important because there is no success without failure and the sooner if you fail the better it is you know failing at 20 is way better than failing at 40 is what I personally believe so it's important to take risks it's important to fail and even if you fail there is no problem with it just don't repeat the mistakes that you do uh and i also feel you know uh, how you treat your members is very important how you treat your community if you make them feel like your family uh like they are uh like you care about them that they are heard in the team tell me about the rodies audition tell me you know when you touched upon that you were on a tv show tell me more about that so it so happened that uh 2018 i won the un award called the v award what's no, the v award it's basically uh, so i basically received this award from the united nations uh, india uh, for you know it was basically given to young people who are changing communities around them uh, and nobody cared about it honestly speaking did you care about <laughs> it uh, of course i did because it was my first ever award in my life that came and directly coming from the un was a big thing for me uh, 2020 I had the opportunity to meet the honorable vice president of india venkai naidu ji nobody cared about it i mean when i say that i mean the social media you know the audience how they react 2020 i did this show called as mtv rodies revolution now i never wanted to be on rodies so the team reached out to me they like please be on the show and i was like no no i don't want to be i'm not as entertaining as other people are nor am i that physically fit mm-hmm. like no come this and that so i did so rodies had four or uh, this thing rounds of auditions gd1 gd2 where you talk gd uh, then you have the personal interview where you go in front of the camera which is basically aired on tv and then you have the culling round now i knew when it comes to gd1 gd2 i'll kill it because i'm a good speaker i can just talk you know this and that when it came to pi i knew these guys will make me dance now i'm a very bad dancer <laughs> but somehow i had this feeling these guys will make me dance now when there i was dancing and all made fun of myself but I, all i know i knew that these guys just wanted to check my confidence that went well culling also happened so after the pi there was a gap of 2 weeks until the culling round and i met with an accident and i broke my collarbone and unfortunately i couldn't be a part of the journey but i had an option if i, I can directly come on the next season and be a part of the journey but i think it was a blessing in disguise i think a person like me on rodius uh, wouldn't be a great thought so even 90% of the people that know me right now is not because of the un award or forbes it's because of rodius that one audition that one audition and that actually changed my life and which is why i became a content creator that was your shot to fame yes essentially how do you go from beating people to beating plastic pollution that's a good question so you know like um my parents obtained uh, at the age of 10 and I've, because of which i became this aggressive kid who would bully around other kids and all now um it so happened that during my 11th or 12th grade my mom was abroad for work and i was here on on my own. I was here all on my own, and uh, that's something that you know made me realize that you know family is your family. That gave me a reality check that you know I might throw tantrums at my mother and she would take it, but the world wouldn't take it. Yeah. And there were a couple of instances like you know there was a short circuit at my place and I didn't know how to handle that, and that's when I realized oh this is life. <laughs> <laughs> and that made me like a kind of a calmer person, and then eventually I got into cleanups. So I think. Uh, it's been a very what do you say black and white journey for me from north and south pole from being this very extremist aggressive kid to being this very nice guy who's doing cleanups complete transformation i think not just not the beach but even my transformation yeah i, I mean I, i definitely see that but you said something about how the beach cleanups made you feel at home they made you feel you know you got the sense of peace after you went back how did that help in you know your maybe your aggressive ways or you know combating your anger any of that how how has the beach clean up helped your anger issues honestly speaking i don't have an answer to that because it just happened i did a clean up made me you know made me feel in a different way i, I don't know the reason till date why did that happen even even in fact you know going and feeding stray dogs or something that i liked so even that made me calm i have always been around stray dogs you know if there were 10 dogs under my building i would go and just sit with them on the street play with them so i was never scared of these stray dogs or something like that so i don't have a specific answer to that question but it just happened now i think everybody has a different um, therapy you can say some people might find it in singing dancing or just strolling at the beach i found it by cleaning the beach 
so that was therapeutic that yes. was meditative yes. being close to the ocean knowing that you were cleaning it up knowing that it was back then it was but now it is not <laughs> what is it now uh, it's become very monotonous honestly speaking i've been a part of more than 500 clean up drives it's become very monotonous now uh, i honestly do get bored going for the clean ups do you yes i do because when you see the same trash same place every weekend for 6 years you will definitely get bored of it so if it has come to the point of monotony what makes you keep going back knowing that every time you clean up there's going to be more trash knowing that every time you know you maybe empty out clean out one beach there'll be people either throwing more trash or more you know trash coming in from the high tide like you said what keeps you going see it's the bigger purpose now and i've never spoken about this before but people i basically live to die so my dream is when i die i want a tricolor on my body and i want lakhs of people mourning not forcefully but people should be at least like insan to acha tha that's my dream you might find it weird but my people that are close to me know about this so i want to do something for the society in whatever capacity i can that the day i die see everybody's going to die but the day i die there's a tricolor on my body my mom would be proud of me you know people would be proud of me he at least did something for the society and that's what i'm working for right now i think other than that everything is just materialistic and it's for the time being short come mm-hmm. forbes happen people will forget even i will forget mm-hmm. all these things will happen but eventually the goal is the tricolor on my body the tricolor on your body is what cuts through all the boredom all the you know monotonous beach cleanups at this point that is what that's the end goal exactly because see when you find a bigger goal when you find a purpose mm-hmm. i think everything else doesn't matter Yeah. What's the next goal though in terms of uh whatever capacity you're doing the beach cleanups at right now? Do you plan on making them bigger? Do you plan on scaling them in any way? Do you plan on, you know, doing it in different states? What what is the next goal with with the cleanup? So, uh I don't plan to scale this up because it has its own challenges because uh doing a cleanup at a one specific location has different challenges altogether from getting volunteers, disposing the waste, political, you know, resistance, all those things. but i definitely want to take this community our community on a global level mm-hmm. i want to represent at the cop like you did uh, talk about beach please there because plastic pollution is not something which is restricted only to mumbai or india in you know, every everywhere. second country in the world is facing it and i think i want people to get inspired through our campaign and replicate this in their vicinities or localities uh, that's easily doable i think because it doesn't take much skill or you know uh, any kind of resources you know it's very easy so i want people to look up to us get inspired and there are already a lot of groups that are doing cleanups including in andamans you know uh, this one group in orissa gujarat that have got inspired by us and are doing cleanups and started their own chapters yeah which is a good thing because we can't be everywhere but we want people to take inspiration from us and take this forward so malha you just mentioned disposal of the trash can i ask once you collect this massive amount of trash where does that go So unfortunately, all the waste that we collect at the cleanups, it goes to the landfills. Now a lot of people also criticize this, saying that you're picking up trash from one place and putting it somewhere else, mm-hmm. which is absolutely true. But this is the best thing we can do. I'll give you an example. Every cleanup drive, we collect around ten thousand kgs of trash. Mm-hmm. Now this trash has organic waste, has furniture, clothing, plastic, non-plastic, medical, every sort of waste into it. Mm-hmm. That needs to be first segregated. Do you segregate that at the no. cleanup? No, I'll okay. tell you why. Secondly, the plastic needs to be further segregated into different categories mm-hmm. that they have. Then it needs to be cleaned. Mm-hmm. Then it needs to be dried, mm-hmm. and then sent for recycling. It is practically not possible, economically not viable. Mm-hmm. So the best way to do tackle this problem is to segregate the waste as source. Mm-hmm. And what we have been doing is we are trying to uh, sensitize the local communities and other masses in the city mm-hmm. that you start segregating the waste at the source and you start recycling and composting the waste there because once you mix up everything it's practically not possible do you think we india has the capacity the resources the bandwidth to start composting to start recycling to start segregating our waste see we have the resources we don't have the political will mm-hmm. and composting is not the solution like composting in every household i think there needs to be industrial composting the reason being that if you go to a lot of these localities in mumbai where they don't, they don't have places to have this composting areas which every society needs to have mm-hmm. what do these guys do what do the people living in the slums do so this, which is why i think industrial composting is the only way forward but like i said we have resources we don't have the like like we don't have the political will to do it how would one go about it if we if we were to start talking about recycling if we were to talk about segregating waste educating people educating consumers how how would we go about it i think the basic thing is that single use plastics need to be avoided 
as simple as that second thing is if you are using any kind of plastics for that matter that needs to be segregated at home you know you can compost your wet waste what is wet waste and what is dry waste wet waste is anything which is organic vegetables meat eggshells something like that uh, dry waste is anything that needs to be recycled like uh, plastic paper aluminum cans so that is segregated separately my, segregated my organic separately. biodegradable waste is separate my recyclable waste is separate exactly and the third bin third bin should be a uh, discarded waste which needs to have a medical waste or something like that so if i start doing this on my end say if i start segregating at home my you know organic waste is separate my dry waste is separate my um discarded waste is separate what happens to the trash after after it's been segregated from my end the thing is we cannot be dependent on the waste management system existing waste management system okay we need to take things in our own hands and we need to start doing it for example if you think that you will segregate your waste and give it to the local municipal authority there's a possibility that they might mix up the waste or or they might not it's up to them but instead what we could do is we can recycle it on our own we can call a bhangar wala you can give it to them you know if you look if you look at the lifestyle couple of decades ago our grandparents would use this uh, dabbas you know utensils used bottles you know we would reuse them nowadays we don't use that we buy new things we'll buy new containers now but we would use the order of food exactly. you get it in single use take so away so i think th- this needs to be avoided also i'll give you an example what waste segregation do- does you know 2018 the uh, bmc started promoting waste segregation at source mm-hmm. within 6 months so mumbai was generating 10000 metric tons of waste every day back then within 6 months it dropped down to 6500 metric tons every day just by segregating waste mm-hmm. so our waste generation in a day reduced drastically almost by 35% so that's how important waste segregation is it's just that we are not giving much importance to it and there are also not strict laws to it now if you look at my society if you segregate like you mix up the waste and you give it they don't collect it and if you do it multiple times there's a fine so i think this is something which every society needs to adopt yeah yeah absolutely how is collecting trash from a say a beach or a river bank and then eventually that ending up at a landfill how is that better than that being at the beach or at the at the river bank okay so if it stays on the beach there's a possibility that it might get into the ocean and there is no way you can get it out like i said okay also when it comes in contact with the water and the sunlight it's going to break down to smaller pieces like microplastics it's going to mix up in the ocean again you can't remove it putting it in the landfills is not a better option but at least in the future you can at least recycle it or at least think about recycling it now obviously you know the groundwater leaching is a problem but then there's no other option than that give me your utopia for a plastic free world like if you were the prime minister of a country and you had to design a plastic policy and a clean up policy and a landfill policy what would that process look like ideal utopia uh i think single use plastics should have been banned and uh, the problem is that we don't have enough alternatives available for it mm-hmm. like even if they are they are not accessible for the average person mm-hmm. you know i would have made that possible because when you ban something that needs to be replaced by something mm-hmm. there needs to be an alternative for it that is affordable can be exactly. just as you know co- compares now, to the quality and true now an average person is not going to buy a bamboo toothbrush worth 100 rupees just because it's good for the environment it also needs to be affordable for them mm-hmm. first thing is that second thing is that uh there so have the been instances first instance, policy for you as as a prime minister would be you would ban single use plastic yes would you invest in alternatives to plastic yes definitely uh talking about the landfills i think the landfills need to be banned and if you look at couple of these um uh, judgments from the bombay high court also that the these uh, landfills should have been stopped couple of centuries ago or sorry decades ago mm-hmm. okay but it's not happening for some reason and we can still make it neutral there have been instances there have been examples that the landfills across india mm-hmm. there are these individuals who have turned them into gardens or into Turned open spaces and fills into gardens yes or open spaces so there was a show called satyamev jayate mm-hmm. there was an is officer who had done the same thing mm-hmm. but they were, they were sacked from his position for doing that that's how it works mm-hmm. so i think that's definitely possible and i think when you talk about any government they have so much resources they have the expertise they have everything mm-hmm. political will is required mm-hmm. 
if there is political will everything can happen you know uh, it wouldn't take us 5 days to clean all the beaches in mumbai not even 5 days if we had what the political will to do it mm. now the mumbai has a waste management system the budget for mumbai is 3500 crore mm. per annum you know just to do what collect the waste from your households pick it up in a van throw it in the landfills mm. it's not there's not even recycling included into this mm. 3500 crore how would you use that money definitely recycling should be the priority because if you only start collecting the waste dumping into landfills eventually the landfills are going to get filled mm. where do you go next how many more landfills are going to create mm. so recycling should be the main priority is recycling the main priority or do you think consuming less is also one of the solutions consuming less is definitely the long term solution mm. but in the short term if you want to see results recycling is the thing see it's i think it's going to take us some time for us to make people understand that consuming less because as if you notice one thing as the income of a person starts going Increasing, up yeah. uh he moves towards a lifestyle of luxury mm-hmm. okay second thing he starts consuming more so madar one of the you know criticism that i hear being in this industry is that sustainability is not for india recycling you know is a foreign term it's a big word how would you explain recycling upcycling to an indian audience is it in our history is it in our culture have we always recycled have we always upcycled without us using the words recycling or upcycling i think recycling and upcycling have always been into our culture uh it's just that we are introduced to these terms now mm-hmm. but we've always been doing that for example our grandparents my dadi when her sari would worn out what she would do is cut it into a a a, a carpet or a cloth bag or something like that you know so which is upcycling basically so we have always been doing it you know reusing utensils if you see if you buy something from somewhere you know washing it and again using it so i think these are the ways of upcycling reusing recycling things which we have always been doing since generations now it's just that now we have stopped doing it and now because we've got introduced to the word recycling and upcycling we think it's not achievable and it's something it's fancy exactly. it's it's something that's foreign and something that's new to us and we almost kind of shy away from it and don't explore the concept of it but right you think recycling and upcycling has always been a part of our yes culture. absolutely are there any policies are there any plastic policies or are there any um you know uh, policies around if i buy something from a brand and if i dispose it and if if it ends up on a beach uh, for example or in the ocean whose responsibility is that to clean so there's a policy called as epr extended producers responsibility extended producers responsibility responsibility for example i buy this cup of coffee uh, from a store let's take an example the name of the brand is x okay i have my coffee and i throw this on the road now usually what it means is that anybody would think that as since i am a consumer i have consumed coffee from this cup i have thrown the cup so i am responsible for the disposal but in fact epr says that not the consumer but the end responsibility to discard or dispose the product is of the manufacturer which means the brand x needs to discard this how it's, would brand x track that product where i'm discarding it and kind of you know bring that back so i'll give an example in japan what they do is if you buy a tv if the price of the tv is 10000 rupees for example mm-hmm. they'll charge you 15000 rupees okay once you're done if the tv you want to you know again sell the tv back you go and give the tv back to the same store mm-hmm. they'll take it they'll return your 5000 rupees the deposit which they have taken from you and then they'll discard it I think a similar policy needs to be happening in India as well. So also, you almost checkpoints where people could go and return exactly whatever you're consuming or whatever you want to dispose. If you could return it back to the seller, exactly the brands need to buy back their products, which they are not doing. Why is the buyback not happening at the moment? I think? think because the policies in India are not that strict, mm. so they don't honestly care about it. It's just happening the way it is happening. So I think the same brands are following the same norms in European Union mm-hmm. because the the authorities are stricter you know they have to follow those laws there mm-hmm. but it's not happening in India because the authorities here are lenient right but also I think logistics infrastructure to have you know the resource the 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 built environment to be able to return these things as well because I know for certain brands and for them sometimes calling for the product back and buying it back from the consumer or having these return checkpoints that's way more expensive than you know just producing a new bottle and shipping that out to the consumer 
right so i think even on ground level maybe those those changes that need to happen as well for it to be feasible and profitable for the brand to take it back definitely but if a brand is making 10000 20000 crores of turnover every year mm-hmm. and you definitely can't expect them to say it's not feasible for us mm-hmm. you have to do it mm-hmm. if you're such a huge corporation or a brand uh doing this minimal things is mandatory for you and you should be doing this i think you should be doing more than that so there could be certain brands for them it wouldn't be feasible but i think for most of them it is is there a gender aspect to waste picking do women have a role to play in you know the waste picking industry in india so i've seen this one thing over the last few years that most of the rag pickers are women mm-hmm. uh for some reason and they don't even have the safety equipments like gum boots or maybe gloves mm-hmm. uh yeah are there any swaps that you'd recommend for a day to day consumer for a day to day individual like you and me that we can do at home right away to eliminate or at least diminish plastic pollution from our end um i think the most important thing is stop buying single use plastics okay for example if you buy packaged drinking water i wouldn't say stop avoiding it completely if you buy one bottle every day start buying every alternate day so at the end of the year you'll still have cut down your consumption by 50% mm. so you can start small year uh if you are using any kinds of plastics start recycling it at least start collecting it and sending it for recycling and i think the most important thing i feel is that start buying less mm. okay i think uh, everything comes down to consumption the more we buy whether even if you buy a sustainable product you know like multiple times uh it's still harming the environment in some or the other way it still has a carbon footprint so i think buying less is the most important thing whether it could be a sustainable organic product or a plastic product yeah that's true and you know people tell you re- buy a reusable bottle it doesn't have to mean you have to buy from an eco friendly brand it just means that you could just use the bottle that you have at home exactly so it's not about buying into sustainability it's i think sometimes just reusing whatever you have and repurposing um that okay so the most effective thing that we could do as an individual is to say no to single use plastic malhar have you always been vegetarian did you grow up vegetarian what are your current dietary preferences so i've had a very uh, mixed dietary preferences all over my life so as a kid i was a non vegetarian i turned a vegetarian at the age of 5 or 6 then again at the age of 13 14 i started consuming non veg non vegetarian food basically and then eventually uh, around 2018 i became a vegetarian again uh the reason me being vegetarian right now is because i've realized its impact on the environment what But is its impact on the environment i think the meat industry uh, it's one of the largest reasons for the uh, greenhouse emissions that are happening uh and i think it's my small way of you know avoiding it or uh, because i think if practically speaking we have to curb the meat industry it's it's a big a uh, battle to fight you know against but uh, i think there are small baby steps that all of us can take on an individual level uh and that's something i'm trying to do but it's honestly for me if you ask me it's difficult giving up my non vegetarian diet but trying to get along with it now so you're vegetarian for the environment yes incredible so i've got a fun segment for you okay i've got a couple of items here that you might find very commonly at your cleanups and i'm going to need you to answer how many years you think it takes for each item to biodegrade or decompose okay do you think you know the answer maybe some okay. of them if you get a single one wrong you're not winning the hamper just so you know even if i get all of them wrong i'm still winning the hamper we'll, we'll see about that <laughs> okay so first up i've got a i've got a plastic fork Can I see just it? plastic cutlery? How long do you think feel, it takes? Just feeling the material. <laughs> I think I like my fork back. I think around eight hundred years. Eight hundred years. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. It actually takes about a thousand years for plastic cutlery to decompose. That's close enough. That's valid. I that's the right answer. Eight hundred to a thousand is fine. Half a point. We'll half, a point. half a point. Half a point. We won't. We're not giving you the full point. Okay. Next up, I've got a plastic toothbrush. Do you want to feel sure. that? Touch Is it that? used? You can figure that out. I don't want it. <laughs> you can. You can It's have fine. it. How long do you think it takes for a plastic toothbrush to um, decompose? I guess around five hundred years. Okay, you're right about that. So I'll give you one full point. 
two points. Can you imagine it takes 500 years for a simple thing that we use on a daily basis? 500 years after we're gone and it'll still be somewhere in the environment. Exactly. All right, plastic straw. Um around 100 years. Not even close. Not even close. No. How long does it take them? So I think it takes about 200 years. for a single plastic straw to decompose it 200 years for one plastic that. straw yeah and imagine so many people using plastic straws every single every day every single day and i think it definitely kills turtles as well so that's that right am i giving i'll give you half a point half a point half so point. makes it two point half one <laughs> half <laughs> i have to think about the math then for a second so i will give you so i've got a plastic takeaway box okay how long do you think a plastic container stays in the environment after we've used it um i think around 400 years close enough add another 100 to it 500 years 500 years imagine so many people ordering food from an app every single day and getting mm-hmm. food in these containers for i think we use it for about 5 minutes 10 minutes half an exactly. hour max and it stays around for 500 years that's sad Last up, I've got a sanitary pad. Oh, this I know. This you know. This I know. I like the confidence. Eight hundred years. Eight hundred years. Bang on. One sanitary pad. Eight hundred years too. Because we find a lot of this. sanitary napkins at the cleanups, yeah. so definitely know about it. All right. I think um, that might deserve a hamper at yes, this I point. Yes, I do deserve a hamper. Okay. Malhar, would you like to tell our audience anything? Would you like to dedicate a shari to our audience? Uh. There's one shayari which basically sums up my last six years, and it goes like कि बेशक सितारे चमके हैं मेरे पर घर बैठे तारे गिनने की नहीं ये कमाई जो चमक है हमारे सितारों में ये हमने गलियों में मेहनत करके लाई है. So I you know I truly believe that you know anybody who works hard and is honest to himself will definitely make it big in life and will be recognized or acknowledged for his efforts or work. So yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to say to the youth of the country? Is there anything you'd like to say to Gen Zs? Anyone who cares about the environment? How can people join you? How can people support you? Um, you know, I've always said this one thing that you know, a handful of people cannot change the current world scenario when we talk about environment conservation. I think we need more people signing up for this. We need more people being imperfect environmentalist, doing whatever. they can in their personal capacities you know uh to lead a more sustainable lifestyle and inspire more people to do it uh, and that does not also mean that you know you give up everything in your life and become this social worker or environmentalist activist where you're living a very minimalist lifestyle uh there needs to be balance uh between your personal life and the things that you believe in but definitely it's time that all of us especially the younger generation starts working towards environmental conservation it could be something as as simple as going and doing beach cleanups something as as simple as leading a sustainable life something as simple as planting a sapling hmm. anything that is possible for you to do but i think it's important that each one of us does something for the environment definitely how can people find you how can people support you and how can people sign up to the beach cleanups so we are active on all social medias uh, the page is called as beach please india you can simply go visit our page uh, register on the link in the bio and join us at the cleanup drive manar thank you so much for being with us today thank you so much for inspiring so many with your journey and for everything that you do towards making mumbai a cleaner greener city